Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a we another Wednesday afternoon webcast. Joining me today is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital. As well, one of our analysts, James Callahan, will be here to talk about the equity markets in conjunction with David's conversation. Of course, at the end of this conversation, you're welcome to ask questions, send them via email, phastings at barometercapital.ca or via the Zoom chat. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hello, Pam. How are you? And James, Hi. thanks for, for jumping on today. Of course. We're um, all great. How are you? Just great. Thank you. Just great. Thank you. We're, uh, we're sort of midway through earnings season. And so it's been a busy time for the team. Uh, everybody's been very focused on going through transcripts and conference calls and, and, uh, and of course, the lead up work to the earnings reports themselves. And uh, so, uh, so far, so good. Um, I thought maybe today we could talk just a little bit about sort of core key themes, uh, touch on uh, how things are progressing, what if anything might be changing, uh, and, uh, and then take any questions that people might have. So uh, as always, we start sort of with our core structural themes. And the most important one is that we do believe we're in a structural bull market that initiated uh, in 2013 when we finally took out the highs from the year 2000. And market's been working its way since the, working its way higher since then, uh, we've been going through a bottoming process in global yields, and that is becoming more and more apparent. Uh, the sell-off in the long end of the bond market now is the biggest sell-off since the bull market and bonds began in 1981. Uh, and, and of course, we also have had a belief that we've gone through a structural bottoming in the commodities markets. So in effect, we've been talking about the fact that we've been moving from a disinflationary environment to a reflationary environment, certainly helped by a very significant Fed policy and other central banks around the world. Also probably helped by fiscal policy being put through by various governments around the world and the potential reacceleration that happens in the global economy as we come out of this pandemic. S&P continues to work its way higher in the channel it's been in pretty consistently since 2013. Uh, S&P basically at new highs, uh, and on the other side, the, the bond market, which we had been talking about having had a sort of an oversold bounce. This is the sell-off in the long end of the U.S. bond market. We rallied sort of from the middle of March through into the middle of April into this downward sloping 50-day uh, moving mm -hmm. average, which is sort of corrective behavior. We thought that might be coming to an end and that uh, likely the bonds would resume their sell-off. And, uh, and it looks like that was the technical setup. This is the breakdown in bond prices. We broke the lows from last June. Then we broke the lows uh, from last, uh, last March. <clears throat> and then we bounced. Um, and so uh, over the course of the past week, you know, it appears that the sell-off has resumed. A few clues that we took from that. First of all, while the U.S. bonds did have a bounce and yields came down, the US, sorry, the German 10 year yields did not pull back at all. So they remain near the highs. And when we look at it today, you know, whatever, five, six days later, after running into those moving averages, bond market does look like it's rolling over. So technical indicators point now again to higher yields. Uh, about a week ago, we reestablished our short position in uh, seven year bonds, 10 year bonds, and 30 year US bonds there is going to be just a tremendous amount of new issue bonds coming to market to finance all of this fiscal policy. And, and certainly the growth numbers and the inflation numbers would point to the fact that there is probably more risk to a bond investor, you know, in a long-term bond that higher yields come. And of course that brings lower bond prices. Uh, the little rally in the U S dollar, as we talked about, likely a counter trend rally, the long-term trend being down as investors take safe haven US dollars and put them to work in productive assets to protect the value of their, of their dollars. And US dollar again has started to resume its decline versus the basket of world currency. So that's versus yen versus euro, of course, versus Canadian dollar, uh, the, the US dollar weakening. And that has you know, important implications, of course, for the themes we're invested in, because for the most part, we believe that we want to focus in 
sectors and themes that benefit from a weaker U.S. dollar. We pointed out the fact that the um, U.S. dollar does tend to weaken through the course of the year historically. Uh, that certainly appears to be the case right now. So uh, also on our themes, the commodity price rally after pulling back through March and into April, as portfolio managers readjusted their portfolios, some of them like to sell outperforming assets to buy underperforming assets. That's not what we do. We believe in staying in the strong assets because these themes can go on a long time. Uh, this is the Rogers Commodity Index, which is an equally weighted index across all types of commodities. And you can see that in the last two weeks, commodity prices re-accelerated to the upside really across the board in commodities. And of course, that again, supports our view that we are in a reflationary market. So it's the very beginning. We only just three months ago broke this, uh, this uh, 13 year decline in commodity prices. And there certainly will be little corrections like we had last month, uh, but we think this is very, very early stage and does point to the fact that we do have some inflation, but certainly reflation of assets globally. One of the things that gives us some more confidence in that is that this blue line is a measure measuring the relative price performance of copper, which is highly economically sensitive, to gold, which is more a little bit more defensive. And after a couple of months of consolidating, the strength in copper has resumed and I've gone on to make new highs, which is part of what gave us the confidence to reshort the US bonds. And now bond yields are starting to tick higher again. So let's look through uh, some of the basic data from this week. Of course, most important this week was earnings. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but certainly topical in the last week was the discussion of changing the tax regime in the US for capital gains. So we just wanted to examine that. Certainly the day that the news came out that the Biden administration was looking at raising the tax on capital gains from 20% to 43%, a very significant increase for those who make over a million dollars, that caused some concern in the market. But let's just look at the history. It's interesting, when we take each of the last three tax increases on capital gains, 1987, 1988 and 2013. Interestingly enough, six months beyond the news, market was higher on average 15%. Now, why is that? Well, certainly they never have the confidence to talk about raising the tax on capital gains in a poor market. They talk about it in a good market. And as we've always said, the best test as to what type of market you're in is how the market reacts to news. So in a bull market, it tends to be, there's so many things going right that it can offset a lot of bad news. So some, not surprisingly, after one afternoon of wobble, market has worked its way higher virtually every day since that announcement, despite some of the, some of the uh, headlines in the newspaper. We also know that over the following six months, on average, the price earnings multiple of the average stock expanded. And we also know that households in general were putting more money to work in stocks. And that's because it generally takes place during a pretty good economy and during a pretty good market. So at this point, it doesn't look like this is something we should be overly concerned about. Certainly, it has had virtually no impact on our indicators. Let's talk about earnings. So far, the earnings season is going pretty well. 200 companies out of the four, out of the uh, S&P 500 have reported their numbers. On average, companies have had sales growth of 7.5% over a year ago. Now, that's a pretty easy comparison because a year ago, we were dealing with the early stages of the pandemic. Earnings growth over a year ago for the, uh, for the average company in the S&P, uh, 48%. Now, let's compare that to how things are going in our U.S. holdings. In our U.S. holding, our average company's beaten revenue sorry, has had sales growth of 12.5%. So we are focused on more economically sensitive companies. They are gaining more revenues than the average company, the S&P. And earnings growth for our stocks, there's 59 of them, we've had 30 report. Uh, on average, we've seen 87% earnings growth uh, 
in the equity holdings that we hold in client portfolios. Let's look at revenue surprises and earnings surprises. For the S&P, the average company has beaten the estimate by 3.3% and earnings by 23%. For the barometer portfolios of those reported so far, just about a 4% revenue beat or almost double and a 32% earnings surprise over estimate. So very pleased with that. However, it is a difficult comparison this quarter because there were very high expectations coming in. And interestingly, most companies are not responding overly favorably on the first day they report. Many of them have pulled back two or 3% on the report. But what we have seen is after two and three days, the, the, the rally is continuing in these stocks and they continue to power forward. One of the groups we saw that of course in was the banks. They came with dynamite numbers, reducing their loan losses, uh, sorry, reserves for loan losses, increasing their loan growth estimates. Uh, they sold off for a day or two, but virtually all of them are trading above where they were when they reported their earnings. Also over the course of the week from an economic perspective, just a great consumer confidence number very significant boost. That's, of course, important as we start to come out of the pandemic, because we, we hope and expect that consumers will step up and use some of the savings to spend money in the real economy. So let's see how that's impacted some of our leadership themes. We talked about the fact that at quarter end, with the rebalancing, the, the strength in cyclical stocks paused, but then showed some resumption in strength early in the quarter. We also said that the rally in 10-year bond yields paused, and we've seen this week that that has resumed. So value versus growth. Um, this is the value ETF, the S&P value ETF, which made up of those companies that would qualify as value stocks, or arguably today, value means more cyclical. After a pullback in the late part of March, resuming strength, and in fact, today, closing at a new high. So value certainly continues to lead the market. Financials, of course, one of the most important and our largest holdings as a firm. Our premise is that we've only just taken out the highs from the year 2008. And in fact, these are monthly bars only three months ago. And we're having a very strong blast off in what we believe is a new structural bull market. And certainly that seems to be the case. Insurance, which we have lots of exposure to, is just chugging its way higher. And after a little pullback at the end of the quarter, the large banks have made a turn and now working their way back uh, higher. So they pulled back to the moving averages. We consolidated much like we consolidated back in the late part of January. Uh, and this theme looks to be continuing higher. So not only are the large banks performing well, not only are the insurance companies performing well, not only are the uh, uh, investment banks and asset managers, we have exposure across all of those groups. Also the payments companies like MasterCard and Visa look to be reaccelerating and making new highs as we look forward to more cross-border travel, which is where they make a lot of margins in the currency conversion. Um, now, how long can the banks perform well? Well, this is just an interesting snapshot I took from the Wall Street Journal this week. This is just looking at the return on common equity. And you can see that for Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, they've seen a big acceleration in the return on their equity. And this is as good as it has been since it was declining in 2008. So after a long period of weak returns on equity, we're now seeing a nice turn that's helped certainly by rates going a little higher, but it's also being helped by some demand for loan growth. So we think we're still, again, in the very early stages of this rally in financials. Industrials, just quietly continuing to work their way higher, both machinery stocks. Of course, we have a very large position in Deer, uh, which crosses both industrials and agriculture. Uh, we have exposure in our railroads. The transports, you know, continue to chug higher uh, over the course of the past week and continue to point to stronger economic activity ahead. Going back to the commodities, basic materials, as we can see, a broad-based index of 
basic materials performed well over the course of the last couple of weeks. But let's talk about some specifics. This is an ETF that owns the Global Metals and Mining's, Mining Companies, a group that was universally hated six months ago, really becoming one of the very strongest parts of the market. This would include things like the copper producers. And as we're seeing a pickup in demand, we are not seeing a pickup in supply. So I did an interview this week with a report on business talking about the copper producers. And while all 10 major global copper producers have development projects that they're working on, 60% of those projects are simply just to expand the life of existing assets. 40% are new, new uh, supplies that will come on. But the demand pickup so far globally, especially due to electrification, looks like global supply will be in a deficit for at least the next two years and copper prices continue to move higher, having a very good week this week, taking out the old highs at $4.30 a pound. To, to put a point on it, the major global producers uh, produce at about $1.20 or $1.30 per pound. So this is all profit that gets stacked on top. Iron ore also continuing to strengthen, nickel strengthened over the course of the week. So this is a group that did very, very well. And after a good sized pullback at quarter end, for instance, Freeport McMoran making a nice turn higher, First Quantum also making a nice turn higher. So this theme clearly continues to work. Uh, the global timber producers, the forestry stocks made new highs today. The agriculture stocks making new highs. We have a good sized position in Nutrien which of course uh, sells all types of agricultural products, but most importantly, fertilizers. The one group that has been lagging in, in the commodity or basic material space is energy. Good sized pullback in energy producers. We talked about the fact that energy had not yet been able to break above the decline that started in 2014, um, but that it likely would. This certainly played a little bit of havoc in equity portfolios uh, through the end of March, the XOP uh, ETF pulled back from $92 to $72, but has made a sharp turn and had a very good day today, now very close to breaking out above that downtrend. So we'll see whether that can get through over the next week. My guess is that it is likely because while it is lagging some of the other commodities, the commodities generally, if we're into a new bull market, should get participation sort of across the board. We're also seeing good participation in uranium uh, or clean energy. Uh, the consumer. The consumer does not look like they are ready to quit. In fact, they look like they're ready to strengthen. We talked about the consumer confidence numbers this week. Very, very strong. The home building sector just having taken out the highs from 2008 <clears throat> and looks to have a very bright future in front of it. The home builders cannot keep up with demand. And one of the concerns that I've had posed to me is what happens if mortgage rates go higher and choke off affordability? One of the things that we saw this week from the Bureau of Economic Ac uh, Analysis was a comparison of actual uh, mortgage rates versus the average uh, interest rate on all outstanding mortgages. And they found that you don't tend to start cutting off demand until current mortgage rates are trading above the average, which means people can no longer refinance or they have to pay more for new mortgages. So it looks as though this is not yet a concern, something that we'll watch, but certainly the home building sector continues to look strong and all of the suppliers into the home building sector. Again, very economically sensitive, very reflationary. Dividend growth theme continues to chug along relative especially to the to high dividend paying stocks. And as we talked about the NASDAQ performing a little bit better, still sort of underperforming the S&P, we have held some of the large cap names that we're focused on based on, on what we think could be you know, quite significant uh, earnings growth going forward. Um, it is an area we know that corporations plan to continue to increase their spending. I've asked James Callahan to come on and just talk a little bit in broad strokes about the color we've seen coming from uh, some of the holdings that we have, and in particular, maybe touch on Microsoft and Google. Microsoft and Google both reported last night. Yeah, thanks, Dave, and, and uh, thanks for having me on. 
Um, so, you know, th there's a reason these companies have grown to be the biggest uh, in the world. Um, they're growing revenue at an astonishing rate and, and it's on a massive base. Um, so to, to talk about uh, Google and Microsoft. So Google grew revenue 32% year over year um, and Microsoft grew revenue 20% year over year. So these reports, of course, uh, being some of the biggest companies in the world, they're picked through with fine tooth combs. Um, but both companies had strong quarters. Um, we, we own both. Uh, so as, as you mentioned earlier, Dave, something we've been working through this earnings season is that because expectations are so high for some of these larger cap names, uh, unless they hit very high bars, they can trade down. Uh, what we've seen, though, is that when a company will put up good numbers, as many of our portfolio companies have, as the chart that, that you showed earlier, Dave, indicates, um, and they trade down over the next few days, they're going to go on to deliver positive performance kind of one to three days out. Um, so to look at uh, Google or Alphabet, the parent company, um, so they beat revenue expectations by 8% to grow over 30% year over year and had a nice beat on earnings as well. Um, within that, YouTube continues to grow at 50% year over year. Um, their cloud segment, Google Cloud Partners, beat expectations slightly to grow 46% uh, year over year. Um, and their board approved an additional $50 billion share repurchase program. So just huge numbers. It was a really strong quarter, um, substantially above expectations. So Google um, traded up about 3% today. Um, bodes well for the rest of the advertising exposed names like Facebook, which we also own and reported just now after the close and numbers look pretty good. Um, and Microsoft. So Microsoft reported only a 2% beat on revenue to grow just about 20% year over year. Um, had a decent beat on earnings as well. Um, to double click on a segment, arguably the most important segment for them. So cloud revenue beat expectations, um, but that's made up of both Microsoft Azure and a legacy on-premise on server business. So Azure growth came in line with expectations uh, to grow 46% year over year. Um, and that was the most disappointing part of the print, if you can believe it. So that means that Azure growth decelerated 2% sequentially, which at the end of the day, it, it, it's small potatoes, you know, 46% growth versus 48% growth, which a lot of investors were looking for. That's okay. Um, besides that, gaming revenue was strong and, and grew 34% year over year. Um, Windows revenue beat slightly. PC shipments are very strong. Um, so all in, it was a decent quarter, but not a blowout. Um, they're guiding to 40% growth in Azure next quarter too, so it, it won't decelerate further. Um, but stock was down 2% uh, today as a result of that. So there's a bit of a disparity between the, the companies that are blowing out numbers uh, with really high expectations and companies that will just beat slightly. Um, no, James, down it, we, we took our weight down from about 30% tech to now I think 11 or 12. Uh, so about a third of the index. And, and, and my take on it has been, first of all, we saw just a little bit of deceleration in the, in the, the momentum of the share prices. But certainly, you know, expectations have been very high in the tech group. And, and certainly it's a pretty crowded sector. You know, it's a sector that virtually everybody went to find uh, some long-term growth in. Um, the, one, the one area that looks to be capacity constrained is, is semiconductors. And maybe just touch on that quickly, just, the, just a broad strokes on what we've seen coming out of earnings, because of course we keep hearing about this global semiconductor or chip uh, uh, deficit. Yeah, so that, that's been something that investors have really been trying to wrap their heads around when companies are reporting Q1 earnings. Um, we haven't seen too much of an impact with companies that were reported so far. Like, for example, last week we had a lot of the semiconductor equipment names which benefit from that shortage because they're selling into the, fab the fabrication um, companies. But, uh, you know, for Microsoft and Google, they're so big that they're going to get whatever they want. Um, but we're looking for Ford um, aftermarket tonight to see impact that they're going to feel. Um, and, and names reporting over the next few weeks will we'll really get a better idea of the impact and uh, impact of forward guidance. Yeah. So, so I, you know, from what I've seen, tech appears right now to be quite bifurcated. The larger cap tech acting a little bit better, small mid cap. Uh, those earlier in their growth phase certainly had more damage through March and, and April as investors have been rotating into some more economically sensitive companies. We'll watch for signs of reacceleration. And if they do, we can certainly top up our weightings. But uh, it's, there's no shortage of, of growth opportunities right now with sectors like industrials and financials and consumer 
really coming along. James, thanks so much for, for jumping on today. Really thanks appreciate for having it. me, Dave. Um, so yeah, um, uh, let's take a look at the last couple of our key themes. You know, we've talked about the fact that global equities appear to be set uh, and have started a new secular bull market. This is an ETF that is made up of leading companies in emerging markets. Again, significant pullback through March and then the beginning of April. And then as the US dollar started to weaken, a nice reacceleration. And so it looks like we're headed into the next upward leg in emerging markets, certainly China acting a little bit better. Uh, and certainly we've seen you know, good strong returns from uh, Taiwan, which actually Taiwan made new all time highs again this week. Uh, um, Korea also strengthening as well. Groups we really don't own, should we be concerned? Um, consumer staples at the end of the quarter had quite a run up. Of course, these would be companies like you know, Heinz, um, Coca-Cola, so on. They are global products. They are globally in demand. This is the equally weighted consumer staples sector. Did have a nice move, but I just want to highlight that on a relative basis versus the S&P, they are actually making new relative lows versus the market. In other words, they are as weak relative to other sectors as they have been at any point during the last number of years. So certainly not unhappy about having a low weight here. And we're seeing the same thing in utilities relative to the rest of the market, really no relative outperformance showing up here either. So the bond proxies or things that are high dividend payers, but with very little growth or economic sensitivity, really don't stand out at this point uh, and their groups we likely will continue to, to, to avoid. Just quickly looking at flows, we talked about how we've been seeing some money come out of money market and into equities. There's been about a trillion dollars worth of equity flows, but you can see that on a multi-year basis, really just getting back to a relative break even from the last few years. And once this gets going, it tends to go on for quite some time. So we think we're still relatively early in this flow back into equities. And of course, very early in the flow out of bonds. New data this week. Well, breaking it up into different groups, we can see that we are having the most significant flow into value stocks that we've had in many years. Because of course, value was relatively underowned and relatively unloved. I think we were early to get there, but this is, I think, fairly early in the process. Let's look at liquidity because we know liquidity fuels markets. The old saying, don't fight the Fed. When we look at the liquidity that's being injected into the market, we have seen this accelerate now since the middle of February. So very significant new liquidity being pushed into the market would help to understand why the US dollar is backing off. Uh, and second, why assets are being held up in price and pushed higher. Lots of liquidity and on a rate of change basis, showing that that is accelerating recently. There's about another $500 billion that the Fed plans to put into the system by June. So again, why do we wanna hold cash when we can hold productive, productive assets that have an ability <clears throat> to sort of fight that, that, um, that uh, depreciation of value of, of currency? Corporate, uh, corporate coffers are stuffed with cash. We talked about this last week, $2 trillion in cash sitting on S&P 500 companies balance sheets. So it shouldn't surprise us that we're seeing a major acceleration in share buybacks. So when we think of the things that fuel prices, earnings coming in well ahead of estimate, liquidity continually getting stronger, share buybacks coming from corporations, which are the largest buyer of shares in the market. And then finally, the individual. This is the growth in savings over the last two years coming from a combined save stimulus payments, foregone consumption, and other sources. As things reopen, we think this money gets put to work in the real economy by the form of travel and restaurants <clears throat> and, and purchasing in, uh, around the home and home improvement. Uh, so again, we think that we are likely to see sort of quite, um, um, quite, um, uh, unified growth around the world. Last few things, volatility remains very subdued. That's a good thing. Uh, credit spreads are the rate that bond investors demand to put money in a corporate bond versus a government bond. 
continues to be very subdued. So investors don't see significant credit risk in the market. So when we look at our, our basic building blocks, our job is to identify the key leadership themes. I think we're there. Uh, we're watching very closely for new signs of, of different leadership. We are not seeing that at this point. And if there's no leadership, we're happy to hold cash, but that's, that's not the case either. We're trying to be tactical. Our indicators continue to be positive. Our long-term indicators for the U.S. continue to strengthen, for global stocks continue to strengthen. Our short-term indicators in the U.S., percent of stocks with a 50-day moving average continues to grow. Percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum turned higher this week. That means that while stocks were in an uptrend, many had plateaued and were trading sideways with no upward trajectory. And we started to see reacceleration this week. That's a net incremental improvement. Percent of stocks hitting new highs versus new lows, of course, very heavily skewed to new highs. And the percent of stocks trading above their long-term moving average above 95%. So the underpinnings for this market are sound, which is why the market was probably able to absorb the news around uh, tax increases effectively, but it means that we are comfortable being positioned. Our sector weights aren't deviating very far from where we have been, financials being our largest weight, industrials continues to become a larger weight, um, uh, technology still about uh, a third to a half of market weight, materials around 10%, three times the market weight, uh, and still an out, out, uh, out, outsized weight in energy small weightings across communication services, community, consumer staples, healthcare, utilities, and real estate. So we own economically sensitive portfolios. We watch the flows. We watch our breadth models. We watch the economic data and we watch the earnings. All of them at this point are supportive. Certainly sentiment is strong. So there's always risk of corrections. We are conscious of the fact that May and June at times can be bumpy, but at this point, the market seems to be absorbing all of the news quite favorably. We'll watch for any sign that we should get more defensive, but I think the bigger risk right now is holding currency that's being printed at a rapid rate. We're better off to be in productive assets, whether that means dividend growth oriented securities or whether it means economically sensitive companies that we'll see outsized earnings growth over the next year or two as the global economy reignites, uh, but we'll watch for signs for change. So with that, Pamela, happy to answer any questions, but I appreciate everybody joining in. Thanks so much, Dave. So we have one question this afternoon, and the question is your thoughts on China and the potential risk of delisting of Chinese stocks on the U.S. exchanges. Um, sure. So let me see if I can just jump over uh, to... Uh, Safari here, hold on. Okay, so China. Well, so the Chinese market <clears throat> certainly corrected through March uh, and, uh, and back into the point where it broke out uh, to the range it's been in since 2015. We're going to see continued saber rattling between the US and China. I think that's clear. Uh, you know, we had Boeing report today Boeing hasn't had an order from a Chinese airline in three years. So there definitely is tension. There is risk to companies like Tesla, uh, that's of course very large in, in China. Uh, and there is risk to Chinese companies uh, as they relate to the US. I think a lot of that is sort of in the market. When we look at uh, the Chinese web companies, this is an ETF that owns the large uh, Chinese internet uh, uh, retailers like Tencent and Alibaba and so on. You know, it's had quite a significant decline. In fact, this is an area where it starts to look a lot more interesting because it's sort of pulled back into the point where they broke out. Uh, but there is real risk. We prefer to be more focused in companies from China that are focused on their own economy. So this is an ETF that is focused on Chinese consumer discretionary companies. They don't have a large foothold in North America, but they have a great growing market at home. And I think this would be my preferred focus, would be to focus on the Chinese domestic economy rather than Chinese companies selling into North America. Certainly, Alibaba has had a tough go uh, going through some of the scrutiny actually coming from within their own country. Um, so we have to be aware of, of sort of political risks. Uh, 
uh, and take them into account, which is why we don't have a huge position in China, but that is certainly a risk. Thanks so much, Dave. Well, that concludes our questions for this afternoon. I will leave you with the final word. Look, I think uh, the bottom line is we want to try and take advantage of assets that benefit from a weakening U.S. dollar and reflation, uh, whether that is, you know, as we've talked about, uh, you know, uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin, which continue to look attractive. Ethereum actually quite outperforming Bitcoin over the last couple of weeks, you know, whether it has to do with uh, copper and uh, the other, other base metals like nickel and iron ore. <clears throat> The world isn't going to build stuff without it. Uh, this is the price of nickel, certainly moving nicely higher over the past week, uh, or whether that is, you know, some of the some of the global stocks. We it looks like this is going to be the first sort of synchronized global recovery we've seen in a long time, and um, we're positioned to try and take advantage of it. So, with that, thank you everybody for joining in. If you've got additional questions, don't hesitate to call us. Uh, it's been great. We've had lots of people reaching out over the last two or three weeks. I'm certainly always happy to jump on and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and uh, certainly our counselors love to talk to you. And so with that, let's sign off and we'll uh, talk to you again next week. Thanks so much, Dave. And thanks, James, for joining us. Have a good evening, everyone.